What we do here matters, because what we don't do matters even more. We need to continue to push, and we at ADAO are going to continue to push the Surgeon General of the United States. As you know, the United States continues to use asbestos, and that indeed is a barrier to others stopping its use. The most horrific part of this whole story is that it is preventable. Um, I'm going to talk about two things. I'm going to talk about the criminal trial in Italy, and I'm going to talk about the controversy at the International Agency for Research on Cancer. Uh, as you, many of you know, probably, there was a criminal uh, verdict at last February of 2012 in which two uh, uh, owner executives in the, uh, uh, of the Eternit company, a big European-based asbestos cement company, were convicted in a criminal court and sentenced to 16 years apiece in jail. Uh, one of these guys, Stefan Schmidt-Heine, is uh, uh, estimated by Forbes to be worth a little over $3 billion. Uh, one of the wealthiest men in Switzerland. Uh, and uh, so now they were appealing this case, this verdict, uh, that they had been convicted of causing an environmental disaster, causing the deaths of so far 3,000 Italians among the workers and the uh, communities around the factories. They had four factories in Italy, they had factories all over Europe, they had factories in, in Brazil, in South Africa. This is a big outfit this company making asbestos cement. So, of course, the uh, first efforts by the defendants were to move to another court. Uh, and they went to the appeals court. This is now, I'm reporting on the uh, appeals court case, which is ongoing and started this month. And so the chief judge uh, made a speech, which uh, you know, I don't think you need to understand Italian to understand that uh, uh, he compared Stefan Schmidt-Heine to Hitler. Uh, in the Vance uh, meetings in uh, the beginning of 1942, where uh, the Nazis uh, made the plans for what they called the final solution. Uh, the defense claim was that uh, they'd spent $45 million on health and safety at their, five, at their Italian plants between 1973 and 1986. The prosecutor said that was exaggerated that the real figure was five to 10 million instead of 45 million. And as an example, they said that grinding asbestos waste at the Casali plant uh, from several other plants was profitable and should not count as health and safety related just because they were recycling material. Uh, the stuff was crushed in the open and moved by earth moving trucks. You can imagine what a mess that must have been. Defense claims of investment in health and safety, the prosecutor said, were not followed by any evidence of the effectiveness of such in having a positive effect on health. The Eternit owners, uh, the uh, prosecutors said, were aware of asbestos hazards since the 1950s and the 1960s, and uh, they referenced the OSHA and uh, UK regulations on asbestos in 1969 in the UK and 1972 here as evidence of what the international asbestos industry knew and demonstrably shared at a meeting that they held in 1971 where they were starting to come under fire in uh, a number of countries, including the United States and uh, uh, Holland and Britain. And uh, the British were the leaders in uh, deciding how they were going to develop a company line, lobby government agencies, and so on. And they were telling all the other asbestos industries around the world that you need to do the same thing. And between 1969 and 1971, lobbying organizations were set up in 10 more countries so it went from one in 1969 in England to 11 by late 1971. So the industry was obviously acting as a, what the prosecutors referred to as an asbestos cartel. Stefan Schmidt-Heine inherited the business at the age of 29, became the CEO of Eternit in, uh, uh, in 1976, uh, 1975 or six. Uh, one of the things, first things he did was hire a German doctor, Dr. Robach, to dispute Dr. Selikoff. Um, he also had a, a management meeting in Germany in, in which a, a summary uh, of this meeting has survived and was found by the prosecutors in which, uh, among other things, they mentioned that some of the managers were really shocked 
to hear how dangerous asbestos was, and uh, it was decided that they need to present the information to the workers in a way so that they won't be quite so shocked. Uh, the uh, uh, letters that schmidt heine sent to the uh, chief executive officer in Italy of the Italian Attorney Company were sent to post office boxes so that even the secretaries of the executives didn't see these letters, the prosecutor points out. Uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, and the other guy, the Belgian Baron de Cartier, uh, who was also sentenced to 16 years along with schmidt heine was the chief executive officer of the Belgian Attorney Starting in 1969, prosecutors said they didn't invest in health and safety. The chief prosecutor, Guarignello, then uh, asked the court to raise the sentence to 20 years, which is what he had originally asked for in the trial court, rather than 16. And so now this will be followed by uh, presentations from the lawyers for the victims. And I have to say that the, the prosecutor did the heavy lifting uh, in terms of uh, prosecuting this case. The victim's lawyers were disappointing. I did work with them and they did bring me in to present some of this evidence to the court, but uh, let's just say I've gotten used to working with far more competent lawyers in other countries. Uh, the uh, uh, judgment is expected by the end of June in this case. And the uh, information I've just given you is basic, ma mainly based on newspaper accounts in March of this year, this month, uh, which were translated by Vicky Franzinetti. Uh, and uh, as you see, this is uh, one of these newspaper reports. Now, this is a picture of Mr. Schmidt Heine. And now, uh, this is uh, this is the. Uh, uh, head of the Russian Asbestos Institute. Well, it's, a, it's actually called an a, a, a Institute of Occupational Health. It's like a government agency, only it's been uh, uh, so taken over by asbestos uh, uh, interests that it was, uh, as you heard earlier today, cut off by the World Health Organization as a collaborating WHO research center. But uh, this guy goes around the world uh, now defending the asbestos industry claiming that there is such a thing as controlled use, that the hazards are all from the past, and uh, they should just be allowed to sell the stuff. Um, in connection with the International Agency for Research on Cancer, um, the uh, WHO, uh, as you've heard, pre writes monographs on uh, the cancer potential of different toxic substances. They've uh, published these over the years. They had, had a very good reputation until around uh, 10, 12 years ago, uh, then they started uh, having problems with the corporate people being involved in the writing of some of their monographs and corporate observers uh, doing improper things during the meetings of their working groups. And uh, because there was by 2000 a World Health Organization uh, rules on disclosure of interest for experts appointed to these expert panels like the working groups of the IARC, uh, IARC was uh, in a position where they were violating that, they weren't implementing those rules. And so we, a bunch of us went on a campaign really led by the former director of IARC, Lorenzo Tomatis. And, uh, and we eventually did, they did a turnover in the management and they got some good people in there and they cleaned things up. And they brought an American guy, a good American guy to replace the bad American guy who was running the monographs program. And uh, Jim Coliano uh, was the incoming guy and did a good job of teaching the Europeans uh, how to do more than just pronounce the word transparency, but how to implement it. Uh, in the United States, we are leaders in this because nobody trusts the government. And so that's why we have a Freedom of Information Act. And the Europeans, maybe for good reasons, had more reasons to trust their governments, but still uh, they would uh, get carried away and have uh, bad consequences as a result of that. Um, and so now, uh, most recently, the uh, Russians decided to renew their uh, contractual arrangements with IARC. Uh, they had, uh, after the Soviet Union broke up, they stopped supporting IARC. Now they came back in 2007 saying we would like to, to renew our support. Uh, in fact, we'll even pay our past dues. And by the way, we've got this study we want to do of our asbestos workers with IARC as a joint collaborator for the world to see what, uh, whatever we're going to find. And, uh, 
So uh, eventually it came out late last year that, that they had this collaboration going on and a bunch of us, uh, scientists all over the world, uh, protested this, wrote to IARC. They were holding a meeting in Kiev in the Ukraine uh, hosted by this Russian institute and uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, Minister of Health from Italy as well as the scientist group from around the world sent letters to IARC saying don't, don't go, don't send anybody. This is obviously a meeting of the asbestos industry to uh, block the, the uh, next meeting of uh, uh, having Chrysotile asbestos added to coverage under the Rotterdam Convention. The IARC people went anyway, sure enough, the Kiev meeting announced that one of their conclusions was that it's premature to include Chrysotile under the Rotterdam Convention for Prior Informed Consent in International Trade. And so we're still fighting about this. IARC staffers also uh, authored a report published in 2012 uh, with lines that would uh, warm the hearts of the asbestos uh, industry. Uh, saying that the industry should be strictly regulated but not saying anything about banning asbestos and that uh, they advise that former workers be told to stop smoking as if things are okay in the asbestos industry today. It's just the people that used to work in the industry that should be told about not smoking. So uh, we're still in, in, uh, involved in trying to do something about this. Dr. Lemon, Dr. Frank and I uh, had meetings with um, Kurt Streif, who's the head of the monographs program today uh, in IARC, and tried to explain to him the basis for our concerns. He told us that he told his bosses to stay away from the Russians as soon as the Russians started talking about doing an asbestos collaboration. But uh, obviously, Kurt doesn't run the agency if, in fact, he told them that. Uh, the, this has been now the subject of a report in The Lancet, a very respected journal, the world's oldest medical journal, which begins uh, by asking whether asbestos cor corrupts more than DNA, meaning IARC, and goes on to talk about this whole controversy. Uh, and uh, so we are, we're continuing to try and uh, get some daylight between IARC and the Russian asbestos industry. <coughs> And the meetings on the Rotterdam Convention are in, are in, uh, mid, are in the beginning of May. And so uh, there's a group of uh, activists uh, uh, that are going to be there. Uh, Fernanda will be there. I'll be there uh, to try and do what we can to uh, uh, at least make it, make it unpleasant for the Russians if they're going to try and block uh, Chrysotel being added under the coverage of the Rotterdam Convention. Uh, it's, uh, well, it's, it's quite a quite a fight. It, the Canadians did this up until now. Canada, with the closure of its mind, said they're no longer, no longer going to block Chrysotile being covered under the Rotterdam Convention, but Russia will be a voting country for the first time uh, this year, and we're expecting a tough fight from them. Thank you very much.